Thank, oh. thank you. Thanks uh, for the introduction and for the opportunity of speaking here. So yes, so I'm gonna be uh, showing some slides first uh, about part do and do functions. So and if you don't know what that, don't worry. So we will see like shortly. And then after a few slides, we are gonna actually do exercises hands-on using a notebook in Google Colab to showcase how Pardu and the functions work. Okay, so every time we have to do a map, an operation that is applied element by element uh, in Apache Bean, so that's uh, what the Pardu uh, makes. But the Pardu is actually uh, much more than that. So the Pardu has a side input, the Pardu has a lot of uh, other options that uh, makes it a very powerful uh, tool. Uh, but we will not always need to use all these options. So if we have to, to do a map in the, in the Apache Bean, so we don't have to do necessarily a Pardu. So there are some helper higher level functions that we can use, such as a filter or a map elements or map or flat map elements that uh, um, are kind of like higher level part that we can just apply in our data. And the first ex exercises that we're gonna be seeing today are actually about this. So um, what's a part do and a do function? Um, in Apache Bean, data is processed in bundles, okay? So, so we have our data here, like for instance, a file, like a full file. And then when we are processing the data, uh, Bean is splitting the data in chunks in what we call bundles. And each one of these bundles is going to be processed in parallel in different workers. Okay, so if we are doing a do function, if we are doing a part do, we have to apply a do function. If we are doing a map, so each uh, each map will be actually applied to just one bundle, okay, or well, or maybe more than one bundle. But uh, each bundle will be processed in parallel in different uh, do functions, and each one of the do functions is going to be actually executed in different workers. That will be one process per worker typically. This is uh, depending on the details of the runner for sure. Okay, so uh, different runners will execute this uh, differently. Like for instance, in a, a batch runner, the bundles will typically be larger. In a streaming runner, will probably be smaller. So, um, um, and each one of these uh, workers, each one of these processes of a function, typically, for instance, in data flow, will be a different process in, in, in a machine. So if we have a machine with several CPUs, so we will have one, one process per CPU. So if we want to write like a more detailed um, part do, so we have to write a do function. And to write the do function, we have to um, overload some methods of, a, of the do function. So here we see all these methods in a Python snippet. OK, so uh, this is a, similar in, in, in Java and other languages, uh, showing just, uh, let's say, for, for illustration purposes here, here in Python. So the, the main method of, of a do function is this one process. So here we process each one of the elements. So we receive as input one element, and we do something with that element. We transform it into a different format. We may filter it. We may uh, expand it and then produce several outputs for one element, like in a flat map, and so on. When we start processing one bundle, the runner will actually call this start bundle method. So if we need to do some initialization before we have to process one file, uh, one uh, element or one bundle, so we, we can do it uh, here. And similarly, uh, finish bundle will be called by the runner when the bundle finishes. So this typically is going to happen several times per uh, uh, run, uh, per job, OK? Because we will be processing several bundles. And when the worker starts, so the runner will call this method setup. And when the worker finishes, we'll call this method teardown, OK? And typically, this will happen once, OK? Because, uh, well, so the worker will be created. And when it's not needed anymore, if the runner destroys the worker, like for instance, we get auto scaling or any other situation, so um, uh, it will be destroyed and, and this method is called. Okay. Let, let, let's see how these methods work. Okay. So um, this is the life cycle of a do function. And this is a, a very powerful um, a, a, a workflow that we can use to make very complex uh, part do's. Okay. So when the worker starts, the first thing that our runner is going to do is calling this method. 
Okay, so this is a good place if we have to start, I don't know, for instance, a database connection, if we are gonna use this database, connect, database connection when we are running and processing our, our elements. Then for every bundle of data, the start bundle is called, okay? And then for in, each, in the bundle, we will have typically several elements, and then for each one of the elements, the process element is called, okay? And we will see later, or you will see later about the state and, and timers, uh, the state and timers API. So we have some uh, stateful transformation. So this is where we are reading these state objects, uh, this method in, in the process element method, okay? Um, the process element method is gonna be called several times, like for once per, per element. And then uh, the, the start and finish bundle are gonna be called, well, also several times, but typically an order of magnitude less uh, because uh, so this is called uh, once per bundle, okay? And then typically if we are dealing with a state, as you will see later, so this is where we write the state objects in finish bundles. And then when the worker finishes, so we call tear down. So if we created a connection in the setup method, so this is the place where we should close that connection in the tear down, okay? Well, the worker is going to be probably destroyed anyways. Like if this is running in data flow, the worker will be a virtual machine that will be destroyed. So it's really not such a big deal if we don't uh, remove some of the uh, connections. But let's say if we want to maintain things uh, clean and uh, decent, so we should actually co close all the connections, uh, all the connections uh, here. Okay. So. Today in the in the exercise we're gonna actually uh, train this this uh, uh, flow and we're gonna see how it works with an uh, actual live example. So the different methods of the of a do function. So typically we will be using the process method only, no, in most of the situations because uh, that's where the transformation happens for sure. But in some situations, so we it, it will be very handy using other methods like the setup, start bundle, finish bundle, and so on. Okay, so remember, setup is a good place to start like a connection to a database or open any other kind of connection or start any other helper process, okay? Uh, here, if you're gonna be um, uh, performing side effects that you will, you will need to clean up uh, later, okay? Like uh, creating temporary files, modifying anything externally to to the worker or to the process, this is not a good place to do uh, this, okay? So so let's say resist the temptation to do this here. The start bundle, if you, for some reason you need to keep track of the elements that you are processing in a batch, and then again in the state and timers uh, presentation, you will see some situations in which this is a um, um, this is a, a, a good alternative, like uh, processing the elements in batch, like for instance, when you're calling an external service and do some batching calls. So he, here is where you have to uh, start tracking this batch, okay? And then in finish bundle is where we, we should actually clear the, the state, okay? In finish bundle, you should, for instance, do the call to the external service, return the result, and then uh, remove the batch and proceed to process the next batch of data. And then in tier down, again, so anything that you opened here, you should close it here, okay? So like any connection, any database connection, network connection, any process that you started, so you should actually, um, you should actually uh, um, stop it here, okay? And then make sure that, let's say, that you clean after yourself, okay? Because the worker is gonna be destroyed, and then you are not gonna have any other opportunity to do this cleaning after this, okay? So you should you shouldn't let's say leave uh, anything behind, okay? Good. This may sound a little bit abstract uh, so far, okay? So don't worry too much about that because we are, when we see the examples, that this is gonna be a little bit um, um, more clear. And one last thing before we move on to the exercise, one let's say word of warning about threat compatibility, okay? The do function should be thread compatible. Uh, when you're working in Apache Bean, so you're gonna be running your code in a distributed system. Uh, the processing is gonna be parallelized, let's say for you, but you should resist the temptation to do some parallelization yourself, okay? Uh, in particular, uh, if you're writing a do function, think in sequential. So you have this P collection, which is a, it's a, let's say, potentially infinite collection of elements. 
uh, treat it as a sequential collection, okay? And process elements in a sequence. Because your do function process, especially if your worker has several CPUs, are gonna be executed as uh, several processes in the same machine, okay? Um, so uh, don't try to start like any parallel thread or try to access any common resource uh, uh, from several uh, instances of your uh, uh, code at the same time or anything like this, okay? Because uh, the SDK is not gonna be thread safe in a in a that's in a general uh, in a general uh, situation, okay? So if you create your own threads, if you do your own parallelization in a way, you have to take care of it, okay? And this is very difficult to do in a distributed system that is running your code in lots of uh, parallel works, okay? So uh, this is a recipe for disaster if you try to do this, okay? So resist this temptation, think in sequential, and let Apache Bean parallelize for yourself because that's actually, let's say, the purpose of Apache Bean. Okay. So this is all about the slides, okay? I don't have a lot of more slides uh, because uh, all this, um, everything that we have seen here, we will see it better in an exercise. So we are gonna move on to uh, to a hands-on session with a notebook in Google Colab. If you want to follow the session, the notebooks are uploaded to the GitHub repository, they too, so you, you should see there, the, the notebooks. There's one notebook that is blank, uh, so we can actually write, uh, the exercises in it, and there's another one with the solutions. Please don't have a look at the solutions just yet, okay? So uh, take the opportunity to try to do this by yourself and learn rather than just look at the solutions, okay? So if you want to follow the code that I'm gonna be writing, so please uh, use this uh, link here for uh, for the notebook, make a copy, and so you can follow the same the same uh, exercise, uh, exercises that I'm gonna I'm gonna be making. Okay, you can also take the uh, uh, notebooks from the uh, GitHub repository and run them in local if you prefer. Okay, but if you prefer to use Google Colab just with a browser, so just just use that. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the presentation here and actually ha I have Google Colab open here, and I need to reconnect because I've been talking too much. Let me just put this a little bit uh, bigger. Okay, so I hope that's uh, good enough to, to actually be able to read in the screen. And we are gonna start with the with the exercise. Um, so this is a notebook interface. I hope you are familiar with it. So here we can have code and uh, text uh, um, living in the same document, okay? And this is a document that we can execute, okay? That we can, that we can run, okay? So, the first thing that I'm gonna be making is uh, installing Apache Bean in this in this notebook. The notebook comes with a Python environment, and we can actually install packages here because uh, this is a virtual machine that is connected to the internet. Okay, so this is installed already. Maybe in your case, if you run the notebook uh, for the first time, this step is gonna take a little bit more of time, and you might see some uh, errors here sometimes, like uh, in in the messages. Those are just, let's say, warning messages rather than errors, so you may ignore them, okay? So run the next cell, okay? And if you can actually run this cell and it doesn't fail, then you are all set to do the rest of the of the exercise, okay? So here, I'm not writing this code, so I'm just, let's say, copy-pasting the code from, from the solution because, uh, well, so it's a little bit boring to, 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 to import everything. But what I'm doing here is just importing Apache Bean to use Bean in the rest of the code. And then we are gonna be using the interactive runner, okay? And then we are gonna be using this object IV to have a look at the contents of a P collection uh, while we go with the exercises, okay? And then the date time, because we're gonna be using some dates and times uh, later on in one of the exercises. Okay, so if you have managed to run this cell successfully and it didn't fail, then you are all set to do the rest of the exercise. Let's do the first exercise, okay? And here I need to let me let me fix this now, okay? Okay, um, I did something wrong. Let me just remove this. Okay, now this looks better. Okay, so this is the first thing we are gonna be making. So we are gonna have a pipeline in Apache Bean small pipeline that is gonna take some numbers, here are numbers from one to five, and we are gonna execute it by 10, all the numbers, and we are gonna produce 
numbers like 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. This is a Pardue, okay? But this is a very simple application, not a very simple map, okay? We don't necessarily have to write a full feature do function just to do this, okay? So we're gonna see how to do this with a Pardue and how to do this uh, in a simpler way uh, by using a higher level uh, Pardue friend, okay? Like a map in this case. So let's start with the solution with the do function. When do it, when we have to apply a do function, we have to create um, a, a class that, in this case, this multiply by ten do function that inherits from being do function. Okay, and then when we are inheriting from being do function, we are forced to uh, actually override uh, one of the methods of a do function. And this is the process method, okay? So we need to declare a method that is called process and that it has actually uh, this signature. Well, it's a member of the class, so it needs the self uh, uh, member first. And then uh, it receives as input the element that are that is passed to, uh, oh, okay, I cannot save it. Okay, well, I will save it later. I will make a copy and I will save it later. Okay, so um, uh, this is the element that will be received by our do function. Okay, so this is the one, the two, the three, the four, and the five that will be received by by our do function. And here we need to do the transformations. Okay, the transformation uh, that we're gonna be making it's a well. So the output is gonna be um, the element multiplied by ten. Okay. Uh, well, clear. So easy. This is an easy task. And now we, we need to return the element uh, or the output as uh, the result of the process method. But we cannot do uh, just a return output. Okay. This uh, works as a generator, the do function. Okay. So uh, this is going to fail because uh, this is not a generator. So we actually need to use yield here. Okay. And, and the, this will work. Okay. So here with yield, and the signature of this method will be um, something that we can iterate as output, okay, rather than just one element, okay, because we are doing the yield, so we can iterate over over the output, okay. If we return only one element, so this would fail, okay. Sometimes people do things like this, okay, to return something that is iterable, but it's kind of a dirty trick, okay. I don't like it, so let's use actually yield, okay. Easy, okay. So this is actually uh, the do function. Let's actually now write the pipeline, okay? So we have already um, initialized the pipeline with some options. In this case, we're gonna be using the interactive runner, okay? Uh, in order to be able to uh, have a look at the peak collections as we go. As a generic comment, we cannot inspect what's inside the peak collection in our pipeline, okay? So, um, uh, for instance, if uh, uh, we had here as a as the constructor in the constructor of this class one parameter that we need to pass, so we couldn't take it, that parameter from inside the peak collection from the data that should be available uh, externally to the peak collection externally to the pipeline. For instance, as a command line input uh, argument that we use. Okay, so we cannot let's say just take things from a peak collection. But the interactive runner allows us actually to have a look about uh, to what's inside of a of a of a of a peak collection. Okay, so for instance, we are gonna create the input data. Okay, for that I'm gonna use the pipeline itself as the first step, and then the pipe uh, the pipe uh, operator that uh, um, concatenates two steps in a pipeline. Okay, and we are gonna create a synthetic uh, collection of data. Okay with the numbers one, two, five, okay? Well, I could have used like a range here or, or whatever, but let's just type it. Let, let's let's have a look at, at this, okay? With the interactive runner, I can do something like this, okay? And if I run this and this is correct, let's see. I will see here the input, see? So this is the input that I just created, okay? It has only five elements, and these are the values, the numbers one to five, okay? So good, so this is working. This is what the interactive runner provides, okay? And I strongly recommend you running things in a, an interactive runner when you are designing your own pipelines because it will make things much easier because you have visibility about what's going on with the with your pipeline, okay? And if you're noticing the interactive runner, that might be more difficult to have that visibility, okay? Good. 
So let me just remove this. And let's actually now have a try to, uh, to produce an output. For the output, the, the input uh, element is going to be uh, the, 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 the peak collection that we just created. And here we are going to, sorry, we are going to actually do a part do. Okay. And to make a part do, we need to instantiate the class that we, that we just defined. Okay. So this multiply by 10 do function. Okay. And then let me have a look at the output. Let's see if it works. So if it works, see, we see here the numbers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. What has happened? So each one of these input elements, so was passed to this process method, put in this variable, okay? And then so we return uh, this element here, which is the multiplication by 10, okay? So it has worked as expected, okay? Let me just show you very quickly that if I do something like this, a return instead of a yield, so this will fail. Okay, let's see. I hope it fails. And it okay, see, because an int, the number that I'm returning is not iterable. Okay, sure. Okay, some people do this things like this. Sorry, like put this around a list or about any kind of iterate, it, iterable uh, structure. Okay, but the correct way is actually is in yield. Okay. Okay. Let's see if it runs. Okay, clear. Oof, a lot of code just to multiply by 10. Eh? So here we have to do the process. We need to remember the signature of the method, make sure that we overwrite the, the right method. We have had to use inheritance for this. Oh, this yield thing can be a pain if you forget uh, and you don't realize. And then this is just like a lot of code just to multiply by 10. Can, 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 can this be simpler? It can actually, okay. So it can actually be simpler, and we're gonna see that as the next exercise, okay. So a do function is a very powerful thing, but most of the times you are not gonna need it, okay. Like this time we're just multiplying by ten, okay. So we don't have to do all this hustle just to multiply by ten, okay. So let's actually have a look at the at the next uh, at the next uh, exercise, okay. So the next exercise is exactly the same one, okay. So I have. Here's some code. It's the same code that we just wrote. Okay, I don't want I don't want to write it twice. Okay, but now we are gonna be making this example a little bit simpler. Okay, so here we are gonna be using one of the part do friends. Okay, and then the output is gonna be like before input the pipe uh, operator, and now instead of using part do, let's see. Well, there is a lot of functions here that I can use, and one of these is the map, see, map, and there is also a flat map, and there is a filter, okay, and there is a map element, oh, or that was, okay, I cannot find it right now, well, I, I cannot find it, yes, I cannot find it because map elements is actually when I have a tuples as input, and I don't have that, okay, so, but, and then the map is applied to the elements, okay, and now here, as the function, I can use just a lambda, okay, so I can use just a lambda function, okay, where I take a number, and then I multiply the number uh, by 10. This is much more Pythonic, okay? And then if I have a look here at the output, well, so the output should be the same, hopefully. Let's see, okay, good, great. And in the same way, just let me just copy this, comment this and show a couple of examples. In the same way that I'm using map here, I could use, I don't know, like filter, okay? I'm gonna filter the numbers and I'm gonna keep only which are those that are even, okay? That can be divided by two, okay? So I'm here applying a lambda that takes as input the number and produces the as output a, a, a boolean, a true or false value, okay? When this is true, we're gonna keep the numbers. When this is false, we're gonna um, uh, uh, drop the numbers, okay? Okay, let's see here. See, we are just uh, kept the, like just the even numbers. I'd let you as an exercise to implement this in your own do function. Okay, so how would you implement this in your own do function? Okay, so that's actually uh, uh, that's uh, that that's really not difficult with what we have seen so far. Okay, so um, uh, well, so so uh, um, show um, share your code in Slack, for instance, where. 
in order to in order to like uh, if you want to have some feedback about that and just let me see because someone mentioned me in slack and i hope that the the okay yes we are live with myself yes we are live okay so maybe i don't have a lot of feedback here so maybe the the the, the show wasn't running okay so so in addition to map so here you have a lot of other functions in the slides you have the details of the uh, most frequent ones, and I encourage you to use those to simplify your code rather than than writing uh, your own your own do function just to do simple things. Okay, so here we don't have to create any other class; we just do a lambda, which is a much more um, uh, it's a much more uh, natural way of doing things with uh, with Python. Good, great. So then, what's the usage of a do function? Well, there are many. Okay. But it's the complex use cases. Okay, so let's let's see how the function works by exploring the rest of the methods that we haven't used so far. Okay, and for this, we are, I'm gonna move to the next exercise. Okay, just let me uh, collapse this here, and we are gonna um, do a, a slightly more complex uh, 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 exercise. So we are gonna so here I'm, I'm already creating a pipeline. Okay, and we have some text here and we are going to be playing with this text okay um uh, for this text uh, i have already created here some code okay for let's say for simplicity just let me run it and see how it works these are the first uh, lines of the don quixote de la mancha um, here we are creating uh, a collection with these lines okay which is one of these elements in a line okay and uh, so so we, this will be the first element this will be the second element this will be the third and the fourth element okay and these are the, the this has only four elements okay but these are full lines and very long lines okay and we want to work in this example with words with a uh, isolated words okay for that we are splitting each one of the strings by spaces okay and then the output of this function will be a list okay and when we apply the flat map for each one of the elements of this list, we will have an element in the in the P collection. So this is kind of like unwrapping the the list. Okay. So um, and I just created this uh, for simplicity. Okay. So this is gonna be the 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 P collection we're gonna be playing with in the rest of the exercise. Okay. But again, this is another a friend of Pardu, and if you want so we can uh, so so you can actually try to implement it okay so uh, well let's actually do that as an exercise okay let me let me show you how could i implement a flat map myself okay let me actually do that okay so we have to create a, a class my own flat map and it has to extend from a do function okay and then, as we said, so we have to uh, overwrite the process method and do something here. Okay. Well, so the input, each one of these inputs, okay, it's going to be one line like this. Okay. Okay. So we are going to be receiving a line like this. Okay. Um, so this element, so we need to. Uh, 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 split it okay let's say words are element split it by space so i'm gonna do one let's say flat map that is specific for this example okay we could try to do a flat map that actually receives as input and another uh, a function and then applies the function to each one of the elements and then traverses the elements and so on just for simplicity i'm not gonna do that here okay uh, and then for each one of the words, we just traverse it and we produce some output. Okay, so we just yield that word. Okay, let me see if this is correct. The code seems to be correct. And then here, in, instead of doing this, we could do something like this. Okay. A part do with my own flat map, and let's see. Let's see actually if the if the output has the same the same aspect. Okay, so let's see. If, hopefully, it will not fail. See here is the same aspect here. Okay, 
Of course, uh, if you are going to be doing this operation, well, so I prefer to use flat map. So I recommend this in flat map. Okay. But this is just again to illustrate that there is no magic behind this flat map. Okay. So here we are just processing and yielding one element for each one of the elements in a list. Okay. In a collection. Okay. And this flat map that we have done here, it's a very simple, but we, we could have actually uh, uh, created a, a constructor, okay? Okay, so, and accepting a function as input, and then using this function here, and then instead of, uh, instead of, um, uh, doing this okay so we could actually um, we could actually try to uh, apply this function to each one of the elements okay let's see if this works like this okay and then and let's see if this doesn't fail and then here we could use the same okay Let's see if this works, okay? See, again, the same result, okay? So we have created just one flat map, okay? Okay, and it, that behaves exactly like this one, okay? So this, let's say, just helper code that makes your life easier so you don't have to reimplement the same things over and over and over, okay? So, so again, a do function is a very powerful thing, but Apache Bean already provides a lot of friends of Pardue with the higher level do functions that you can just use for your code so you don't have to write them, okay? Good, okay. I hope this has been clear, okay? So so this is the constructor of the of the class, okay? So the constructor has to have self as the first argument, and this is the argument that is passed here when we instantiate this class, okay? So this is the argument that we have passed. It's a function, it's something that we may call, okay? And here, when we have used the parentheses, we have actually call this element okay so this is the beauty of what python that makes it very simple to do this kind of things okay and then the output here where we have set words because well so uh, uh, because uh, we were splitting words but let's say this would be the elements the output elements okay okay and then here we could i don't know like put like a little bit more of a more meaningful names for the variables okay so this is a flat map, okay? And we, we... Let me see if it just runs and make sure that I haven't screwed up. Okay, perfect, okay, it works, okay? So this is a flat map, okay? So this, again, is just another do function where, well, we haven't gone much farther than in the previous examples. Again, so we have only over uh, written the process method. We haven't touched any other method yet. Okay, so we will do that next. But uh, here we have seen how to we um, create a constructor for for the class. So if we need to initialize it, okay, for some reason, like in this case, just to 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 use a, a custom function that is applied to to the element. So well, we can perfectly do that. So we can put this as a member variable here. And then use that in the in the process method. Okay, I haven't mentioned that in the slides. So we have talked about the setup method, the teardown method, the start bundle, finish bundle, and so on. When each one of those is called and so on. But of course, the constructor of the class is another method that we may use to um, uh, personalize our do function. Okay, and the constructor is only called once when we create the instance. Okay, like here. Okay, it will in reality be call once per worker, okay, would, because we will have different instances of our of our code in different workers, okay? But this is another method that we can use to, let's say, to control our do function, okay? Just like any other class, okay? So this is the initialization of the class. And this works, let's say, exactly the same as in normal Python or Java or the language that you are using, okay? So you just, uh, you may initialize any input argument uh, that is passed to your do function, by using the constructor, become um, making it a member variable, and then using the, using that member anywhere else in your class, like in the process method. Okay, good. Let me run this to make sure that we are we have the right uh, the right uh, um, copy collection. 
and and this is good okay so let's let's move on why am i using this example here okay with this text and and splitting this into words okay so you have probably already like uh, found out that um this is the typical example in any big data framework okay so this is the example kind of like the hello world of a big data framework is to count words uh, in a collection of data okay so this collection is really not big it's just for the example but it's it's a similar uh, type of example in order to count words uh, so we we need to apply some cleaning okay look at this okay so this is in uppercase here we have a comma okay um so if this appears more than once and we need to count it okay so we should rather normalize the text making sure that we lower, for instance, all the instances or we upper, and then we, before we actually count them. Or otherwise, if we have one lower case here, it will be counted as a different word, okay? And saying here the word mancha, so it appears here with a comma, okay? Because it's a, with a comma in the original text. And if we run, if we don't remove this, if it, if this same word appears with another symbol here or with no symbol, it will, count, it will be counted as a different word, okay? So we need to, clean this okay how are we gonna clean this well with a do function of course or with a map maybe let's let's see that okay so uh, the cleaning function will receive as input a word and it will produce as output another word that is clean okay applying some process uh, here i have already created this function for ourselves okay because it is not relevant for the sake of this exercise what transformation we are applying, okay? Just very quickly, we are removing the dots, okay? And replacing it by the empty character, okay? We are uh, replacing here uh, the commas by the empty character, and then we are replacing here also the, the columns by an empty character. And then we are transforming to lowercase, and we are returning this. By all means, this is not a, an exhaust, exhaustive cleaning of the world, okay? So we should do many more things uh, in order to make sure that we are able to count words uh, uh, properly in, in a, let's say, in a real setting, okay? This is just an example for this uh, exercise, okay? So let's actually uh, start applying this to this collection, okay? So uh, we are gonna take the, the words, okay, and we could uh, we could just apply a map like we did before, okay? And here the the input to the map has to be something that is callable, okay? So it's a function, a callable ob object, okay? It's here we have a function, so we can actually so we could do something like this if you want, okay? Lambda word, we are gonna apply the word like this, okay? But if you realize, okay, if the only input argument to this function is this. And it's the same input argument as to the lambda, okay? So we can actually just simplify this like this, okay? And use the name of the function as a reference, okay? And let me put this, this is clean. And let me, let's have a look at this. Sanitized work is not recognized because I haven't run this down. Okay, now it should work. Okay, here it is. Let me just scroll up a little bit. See, this is now in lowercase, okay, as the transformation that we did, and mancha appears in lowercase and without the comma, okay? So now our words are ready to be counted. Um, here I have applied the map. Let me just, uh, sorry, let me just, uh, let me try to make the same with a part do, okay? So how do I do the same with a part do? Well, I, ha I have here to put a do function. Oh, okay, so let me let me create a do function. Okay. Okay, so I have do here the do function. I have to extend from do function. I have to uh, override this process method. Okay. And the input is the element. And then I do. Well, the, the result of calling sanitize uh, word on this input element. Okay, let me see. And then here I can just apply, apply sanitize word. Okay, 
I instantiate the do function. See, I, I'm not passing here a reference, okay? I here I have to instantiate the class, okay? And this is the do function that is gonna be applied, okay? So see, this is different than, than here. The here is a reference, okay? Because I, I may call this, here I have to instantiate the do function, okay? And then, let me... okay, see, same result. Okay, so this is the code, okay? And similarly, uh, as we did in the previous case, we could, so here, this is a do function that only works with the with this specific function, okay? What if I want to apply any other function? Well, so I could do that, okay? I could just create here the, the constructor and pass a function, okay? And then put it as a member variable, okay? And then just call it here, okay? And this that I have done is actually a map. Okay, so I have invented another map. Okay, this is my map, let's call it. Okay, my map do function. Okay, and then here I can just do my map do function sanitize work. Okay, and it should work in the same way. Okay, and again here I'm passing the reference. Okay, because this works exactly as a map. Okay, so I have invented the map here. Again, a map is only a helper function that is available in Apache Bean for your convenience, okay? So you don't have to write all this code when you want just to apply a function, okay? Or create a, a do function that I created like the previous one that is actually a specific just for one function, okay? Like wrapping a function around a do function, okay? So that's really, it's, it's silly, okay? So we shouldn't be able to, we shouldn't need to do that. Okay, moving on. So we have seen again similar example. Now we have this collection of clean words, okay? And now we are gonna apply, let's see here, we are gonna see, and let me fix also this here. We are gonna uh, uh, see how each one of these methods, um, tear down, set up, and so on, work, okay? So here I'm gonna create this do function and I'm gonna apply it to our data, okay? So for sure I will have to use here Pardu, okay, because the well, so uh, I cannot use this finish bundle, start bundle, setup method, uh, and all these methods. I cannot use this with map, with flat map, or with all these higher level functions, okay, because those functions don't accept a do function as input, okay. The only thing that accepts a do function as input is a pardu, okay. So if I'm gonna do fancy things uh, uh, using these methods, I have to you uh, create a do function and use pardo okay so le let's do that okay so well so um i'm gonna make a simple do function for the moment i'm gonna transform each one of the words into uh, uppercase and then i'm gonna put things in the different methods okay to actually have a look at, at how how these uh, methods uh, work okay okay so let me put this here and the process method is the first one i have to always override okay this is mandatory to override okay and i'm gonna yield element uh, upper okay for instance okay and uh, let me see if okay this is correct okay this is correct and let's apply this okay let's put these transform words are the clean words the ones that i have actually created before and I'm gonna apply a part do. And I'm gonna apply my change word uh, do function. And I'm gonna have a look at this P collection. Let's see. Let's see if this works. Okay, so see, all the words are in uppercase. So this is working. I haven't done anything yet. Okay, so this is the same as before. Now we're gonna start writing some, some methods. Okay, so let's actually uh, uh, let's actually create here the, the start bundle method. Start bundle method, okay. It doesn't receive any input, okay. Uh, so it's just a method that is called, okay. And we are gonna put here, and I have here, let me just put here some and let me take some code okay so uh, i'm gonna create a method here i'm gonna be called like this okay let's call now okay and it's gonna return this okay and i apologize for actually uh, copy pasting code okay it's not my style but i hate formatting dates okay and I'm probably you do too 
Okay, so this is just to provide some visibility on uh, when each one of the methods is gonna be running. Okay, so okay, so um, here, uh, this moment, let's call this, and let's print bundle started at this string, okay? Let me run this and let me run this again, okay? See, this method has been called. I didn't call it, okay? I just created the part do and the do function, okay? I didn't explicitly call this, okay? But this method, it was actually started at this moment, okay? This method has to be called after the, after the, the constructor, okay? Let me put here a dummy constructor, okay? This moment is self now. And let's put constructor call at. We are not gonna see like a huge difference or maybe no difference at all. So maybe I should use here milliseconds also, okay? Because, uh, well, so it's gonna be, it's, it's running, let's say in, in local in my laptop, okay? So uh, I did something wrong here. Uh, uh, let's see, make sure what I did wrong. Okay, oh, of course, this is not S, this is this moment. Okay, now again, okay, see the constructor is called, and then after a while, the bundle is called. Okay, so well, after a while, after three seconds. Okay, well, but then we have seen the difference. Okay, so this. This was actually called here, okay, when at this very moment when this was executed, okay, but this method, the part do, is actually not executed until we call the run method of the pipeline, okay, and that happens when we do this, okay. This is actually just creating the graph that is going to be executed, and at the moment of the creation of the graph, so we are actually calling this call, this code here, okay, that's why this is uh, appearing here, and then later on when the pipeline is actually run is when we see this, okay? And this has been the difference of three seconds in this case. Okay, what if I, I uh, override the finish bundle method, okay? Well, let me actually, uh, let me copy paste a little bit, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna change this and this is gonna be the finish bundle method. I'm overwriting this method, okay? And it's gonna be similar. Okay, so this is when the finish, the bundle is finished. And it, I think it's gonna be actually started and finished almost at the same second, because it's just four lines of text, okay? So it's really not a lot of processing, okay? And yes, so it actually finished in the same second, okay? Okay, so the bundle was started and then it was finished processing, okay? And this happens, okay? Well, four seconds after the creation of the constructor, okay? We still have two other methods to, to have a look at, okay? So let's, the, the other methods, okay? It's the setup method, okay? This method is called when the worker starts, okay? And I'm gonna put here the worker because here we, I'm actually using the, using the, the uh, interactive runner so there are not many workers, it's just a process in my laptop, okay? But um, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the concept uh, still applies, okay? If we're running in a distributed system, so this would be a process that is actually uh, um, uh, running somewhere in a machine, etc. okay? So let me see. The order, uh, so I cannot save, I will make a copy later and I will share it later. The order in which I create these methods, it doesn't matter, of course, okay? So these are just methods that I'm overriding in and it's the runner, the one that decides how and when these methods are gonna be called, okay? So this method is gonna be called the first, then this method is gonna be called the second, and this is gonna be called the third. And for sure, the order doesn't matter, the order in which I write the code doesn't matter, as long as, let's say, I'm just overwriting the right method, so let's say what it matters, okay? Okay, construction call at the 42, the worker started at 45, one second later, the bundle started and then the bundle finished, okay? 
again C. Okay, so this is the order like setup, start bundle, finish bundling, which has been called. Okay, and this is not the same order in which this is. Okay, just let me put here. I don't know. Like for instance, here in the middle, let me put the other method that I need to call. It's called the tear down. Okay, I have to put also the self, and with your permission. Oh, sorry, this is a colon. Okay, with your permission, I'm gonna just put this. I'm gonna copy paste. Okay, it's the same code. Okay? So, and this is when the worker is finished. Okay, or is actually destroyed. Okay, so we have now the setup method and the tear down method. Let me let me just let me put it in the right order. Okay, we have seen that the order doesn't matter, but let's say in chronological order. Okay, so this is. Uh, well, for sure, the, 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 the first method we are going to be calling is the constructor. This is called once when the worker is created. This is called once per bundle when it's started. Then this is the next one that is called when the bundle is finished, okay, when the full bundle is processed. And then when the worker is not needed anymore, so we call teardown, okay? And then this is called once per, um, per input element. Let me see this here. Let's see, the constructor was called at this moment. The worker started, oh, sorry, the worker, see, sorry. Worker finish, okay. Okay, and the worker is actually, it should be, should appear twice. I don't know why it didn't appear, okay. Let me, let me just see why it didn't appear, when this didn't appear, the tear down. Okay, now, okay, so here it's appears, okay? And if I put anything else here, just let's say just to show you that there is no trick here, okay? Anything else should, the syntax should appear there, okay? Hopefully. <laughs> okay, here it is, okay? So it was correct. Okay, so just let me remove it. It's working as, as expected, okay? Constructor. The worker was started, then the bundle was started at the same second. Well, it happened everything in the same second. Then the bundle is finished, and then the worker is finished. Okay, and these two could happen more than once if we had a lot of data. Well, that we don't for this example. Okay, but if you run this, for instance, if, instead of taking the four sentences, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna scroll up. Say. So instead of taking the first four sentences of Edgy Shot, you take the full text, which is available in the project Gutenberg as a uh, public domain uh, uh, work so you you should actually see uh, more than one bundle for sure okay because uh, well it's, it's really not huge okay uh, but it's a couple of megabytes five megabytes so for sure you should see more than one bundle okay and then you can you can try with that with that example okay so with this we finish the example okay so let me just uh, uh, make a copy okay so so i can actually uh, share with you this code okay just let me but um, don't worry about this as exact code because the solution is also here in the in the in the bin in the github repository okay so here you have this life cycle with solutions okay so this is the the solutions of the exercises and this is the the blank one okay but i'm gonna also upload this one with this very uh, same code that i have actually used here in the in the in the session Okay, so this was all, folks, um, and now I'm ready for your questions. Thank you so much, Israel. Let me see. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking for the questions. Okay, so we have a couple at the Slack. This is a question for Alexandra Sayenko. He says, uh, I am currently using Nexus Spark code data frame for each partitioning. I think you should read this because this is a, a code that he, let me share it here. I'm gonna share it here at the chat with you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. So you don't have to jump. Uh, yeah, another screen. So question from Alexander in yeah, so Pedro posted here. So and mm -hmm. and instead of using next spark code, okay. So this question looks difficult. Data frame for each partition, partition group for each, but can't find any Apache being equivalent. 
how to get all elements collection from bundle. Okay. Okay. And then if you see the reply, Alexander added the entire, the complete, the full version, ah, full of, version the of the question. I hit to call uh, external REST API endpoint to push records and extract some values from responses. But the problem is that this particular REST API works much more efficiently if I'm sending records group into 1000 records batches per each REST API call. So per element per record basis is not a good solution. Totally, totally, totally agree with that for this because of poor performance. Completely agree with that. I currently use the next Spark code, data frame, partition, blah, blah, but can't find any Apache bin equivalent uh, group into batches, uh, not applicable. Totally, it's not applicable in this case uh, because I don't have any key to group records into 1000 batches. Okay, this is actually a, a good question. This is a very good question. Okay, and I think I'm not going to answer it here because this question is going to be answered in the session of uh, uh, talking about the state and timers. Okay, so you need to group things into batches and then uh, for each one of the batch, when it reaches a, a certain size, like a, a 1,000 elements in this case, you make an external call. You are gonna see this example in the in the state and timer sessions, and and uh, I can actually I can actually share like a preview of this, okay? Uh, because this is actually this. So there's a post in the uh, in the Bing uh, blog, okay? And this batch remote procedure call. This is exactly what you are asking for, uh, Alexander. So let me let me just put this in the very quickly in the Slack. Not sure, I think you are there. Okay, so I just paste in the link in the Slack. Okay, so and um, well, just to uh, mention the state and timers patterns session yes. is happening to today at eight thirty p.m. UTC. So in case, Alexander, you want to join that session. Yeah, I strongly recommend it uh, for mm -hmm. you, Alexander, and for everyone, because this is the very, like, this is the canonical problem that you solve with state and timers in Apache Beam. So this is what you're looking for in Apache Beam. Great. Uh, the next question is from Amit Mondal. And he also says, in which part of life cycle should be exception handling, say a connection dropped unexpectedly? Okay, I think that probably should be in the process method. Okay, so let me go back to 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 here in the in the code. Like when you are doing something here, okay. So you are doing uh, trans the transformed element. So you are like, for instance, in this case, it's just upper end, okay. But say that you do something here with this connection or with these objects, and then this may fail, okay. So here you may try to do something and if some except happens okay uh, well so you can i don't know that you could create like a message okay something fishy happened okay and now instead of of uh, uh, yielding just one element so here you may just yield the transformed element okay and if this you can actually have and this is kind of i'm not sure when this is gonna be uh, this okay and let me just put this correctly so this is the part and so so um this is what you are let's say looking for uh, this is what you're searching for okay so when something happens when you're transforming the element so you want to do something else and typically if you cannot recover from this error, so you can you want to produce like a dead letter Q, another parallel output with the with the with the with the some error message that uh, will help you to debug what has uh, happened. Okay, um, in the in the in the main document, the programming guide of Apache Bean here. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Let me search for it. Uh, I cannot find it here. Tax for multiple outputs. This is what I was searching for. Transforms, okay. Additional outputs. Okay, so this is, I think, let me just put again this in Slack. Okay, uh, this is not a, um, 
not exactly related to to this uh, to this uh, to this session, but yes, I think this is what you need, uh, Amit. So this is probably what you are uh, uh, looking for here. Okay. So this having these additional outputs, and here, so well in the in the in the in the web browser, I'm showing the the Java example, but you can also see here the, the Python example. Okay, and this is very typical typically used to handle errors and to implement the letter Q in your in your uh, transformations in your do function. Uh, our next set, uh, question is from Steve, and he says, uh, why does return work in this case instead of yield? That's actually a good question that I don't know the full answer for. Okay, so return alone doesn't work. Okay, so it works if you return an iterable. Okay, so let me see here. Uh, let me go back no, or here. Yeah, let me go. Back. If I do this, this is not going to work. Okay. Okay. So because this is not an iterable. Okay. But if I do this, because the output is iterable. Okay. Uh, the P collection will receive this element as, let's say, as uh, as element. Okay. Not the list. Okay. The, the, the element that is inside the list. Okay. I think that's why it works. Okay. Because this is iterable. Okay. So, but return alone, this does not work. Okay. So that's why I recommend you using here deal to like to implement like a generator and return always things that are iterable. Okay. So and, and same here with the deal. Okay. So if I put this, this will not work. Okay. So you have to put deal or like trick it into an iterable somehow. Okay. But I don't recommend that. So just use deal. And uh, we have uh, Inigo San Jose, who is our next speaker. Uh, saying that this will be covered in the next session. I think right. this is related with your previous, yes, your previous comment. Okay. Um, I think uh, we don't have time for more questions, uh, but we are adding all the questions to the Slack. So uh, Israel can. Uh, You can go ahead and take a look there and I don't know, continue answering the questions at the Slack. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, let's say, uh, I'll give a work in the, in the channel in the Slack and I will try to answer some of the questions. Okay. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Israel. Thank you, everyone. I know you have a lot of questions. Uh, please be patient. Israel will be there in a minute and we'll answer everything for you. Oh, uh, the next session, I'm just hearing that the next session is at 1.30. Do you mind to keep answering right now, Shail? Yeah, let's go, let's go. Let's okay. keep answering let's go. for sure. So Sorry. the next question is from Tudor. He says, how can I skip transformation from an element into a DoFN? Say for an element that means a certain criteria. I don't want to deal. How can I do that? Just don't do it. So, okay, so I'm not sure if I can return to the sharing the screen. So I stopped sharing my screen. So maybe we can, uh, let me share it again. One minute. I'm not sure if that's uh, possible like to, to have it in the in the video again. Okay, so like to show one, like a code snippet. Okay, now perfect, okay. So say that in this transform method, I don't want to, I don't want to, I just want to, I just want to, let's say, I want to only produce output if the element pro it, it fulfills some conditions, okay? So I do this, okay? I don't have to do here like, no, just don't do it and you will have implemented the filter, okay? So if you don't yield anything as output of your method and let's say ignoring this, okay? So just let me ignore this, okay? So then uh, that element will be just Omit it and ignore in your in your code. Okay, so just you just do it like this. Okay, so um, and this is the way you implement a filter, for instance. Okay, so this is the way you could implement a filter. So just don't yield it, and that's all right. Perfect. Uh, so the next question is from Dan Young, 
and the question is, is there any way to adjust or configure the bundle size on say the read from pop stuff with subscription? Uh, no, so the bundle size is decided by the runner. Okay, so it's a parameter that the runner decides and it depends on different conditions in, for, for sure, like data flow, Spark, Flink will use different values. Data flow will use different values depending on the properties of the workers, depending on whether this is a batch or a streaming pipeline, and you cannot influence the bundle size. So no, so that's not a, something that you can change. Perfect. And uh, the next question is from Pierre. Uh, he says, where in the do FM function do you keep state? And would you cover this in another session? This will be covered in another session, and it, it's, it's kept in, in the so-called state variables. Okay, but so uh, more on that later in the, in the in this another session. Perfect. And the question from Pradeep: Is bundle same as micro batch? In a way, you could say so. Okay, so you are just splitting in micro batches in order to process each bundle. Uh, uh, separately, so yeah, in a way you could say it's micro batching. Okay, if the question is about the streaming and bundling and micro batching, then uh, this doesn't affect the the fact that you can actually uh, group or elements uh, bundle elements together by event time, and therefore this wouldn't be micro batching in the sense of a streaming, where you are just let's say splitting the data by processing time and not being able to reason about time for messages that fall in different buckets in this micro batching okay then if that's if the question is about that it's not micro batching it, it, it's not related okay but yeah if you can just say that if you want to say that bundling is micro batching yeah for sure so it's you have a big batch of data that are uh, and you split it in small batches so you can actually process it in parallel in the smaller uh, elements and um, in, in in different workers okay and we have another question for nicolai and it says, is a bundle start or stop good place for lodging? Do we have something here like execution context about P collection? It, it could be a good place uh, for logging. Okay, so uh, probably a bad place to for logging is the process method because you are like you you, you can be producing one line of log per element. That would be a lot of logging. Okay, and then then that probably will have an impact uh, in the performance of your pipeline. But bundling, like uh, the start and finish bundle, will be will be called, let, let's say, one order of magnitude less times than the process methods, OK? Because elements will be grouping bundles in big bundles for some definition of big. So yeah, it's a good place to, to, to produce a, a log, OK? And if you need some kind of context, OK? So well, so so you you may, you have uh, your member variables in your in your do function class, okay? That you may initialize or like set with some context when, for instance, when you are in the process method and you are receiving the process context, or in the at the initialization or at any other moment, and use those variables in the login when you are using the start bundle. Okay? So I, I think it's a, a good idea to 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 log at the start and the finish bundle or at one of the two rather than the process method because you will be reducing the amount of logging. Okay, so yeah, for sure. And for the context, well, so it's a class. Okay, so just use members and other variables, let's say, to convey and values from one method to another. Perfect. And we have another question from Andres. It says, I hear you say that it's better to use interactive runner to test your pipelines and monitor them. But in the last session, the presenter said that sometimes there are bugs with interactive runner. How can you monitor and test your pipelines from data flow? Okay, I'm not sure what those bugs are. Okay, so um, so we have seen that we have had, we have had quite a smooth experience here today with the interactive runner. Okay, but if you want to let's say test your pipelines, okay, not 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 you don't have to do this with the interactive runner, okay? So um, uh, there's an object in, in Apache Bean that's called the test pipeline, okay? So let, let me let me search for the link and I will post it here uh, in the in the in, in Slack. Okay, and wait one minute because I'm going through the documentation, and this is somewhere in the website of Bean. I remember to see this somewhere, okay? Uh, uh, uh. 
Yes. Uh, well, I cannot find it right now, but I will I will paste it later. Okay. So. Um, yes. Common line for patterns here. Uh, I cannot find it right now, but there's an article about, ah, here it is, testing your pipeline, okay. Okay, so let me put, put this in the Slack. Okay, uh, where is the question? Here, Andres, okay, let me put it as a comment in the thread, okay. So this is the article I recommend you. So basically you may just create an object for a, a test pipeline and you have full control over the environment here. And then you may, let's say, emulate a runner with your test pipeline. and test pipelines uh, 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 locally, okay, without having to run them first in the in in, in a service. So if you're going to be develop, developing a complex pipeline, I strongly recommend you implementing uh, unitary testing and the pipeline test also using test pipelines, okay, so uh, Beam is prepared for this. And so this is, let's say, the proper way of testing things, okay. The interactive runner is more for explorative work that uh, you are doing before you actually let's say write the real thing okay so so to, to to be able to have some visibility about how your code is behaving okay but um, if you are gonna be testing like actual testing so using test pipeline is much better it's a much better option perfect uh we have another question from pradeep it says how can i log all messages in a bundle or count bundle size yes okay again so this is probably gonna be covered in the state and timers option um, session so you would have to keep a state variable that you would initialize in the start bundle method and then every time you process a an element you increase that variable okay and then in the finish bundle method for instance you just put it in the log okay and then it, that variable will contain the number of messages that were in that bundle that was just a process okay but for that you need to use a state Okay, and uh, so I recommend you to, to uh, attend the state and timer session because uh, that's probably, I'm not sure if this specific example will be covered there, but with the contents that you will see in the session, so it will be probably easy to implement afterwards uh, by reusing what is shown in the session. Perfect. Well, we don't have any more questions right now. And thank you a lot, Israel, for having all these resources and be so, uh, so quickly jumping from one application to another and sharing everything. And well, just want to let you know, Israel is going to be providing other uh, courses during the program. And uh, please also take a look at the program so you can tell uh, which specific, I mean, sessions you need to attend or, you know, any anything special. And Israel is going to be at the Slack also as as well as the other speakers so please uh feel free to keep as, asking there tag him if you have an, a specific question for him if not we will try to monitor the slack as uh, also the youtube and add the questions to the slack and tag the speakers and well we are going to be back in 15 minutes i guess yes 15 minutes with our next session and well thanks a lot israel for the Thank session you. and thanks a, a lot all thanks thanks a lot to all the participants